Val, and uh, I want to start by, uh, I am going to uh, follow uh, Carol, but I, I think I'm going to take a rather different take on uh, similar material, because I feel very implicated by uh, this process, and I, uh, I don't think I'm doing an out there history, which I kind of felt there was a sense of in your talk. I feel it's all about me, which is what I'm going to try and talk about as well. Uh, and actually, I was very interested in what Carol said by contrast with uh, uh, what I've done, because she spent much more time on looking in detail at the uh, Robbins report than I'm going to. Uh, partly because uh, I feel there's there wasn't very much at the time about feminist theories. Although, coming here this morning, I noticed that uh, Val had brought some books, and then I said to her, have you brought uh, Betty Friedan's uh, The Feminine Mystique? And she said, oh, no. And I said, well, that came out in 1963. So, 63 uh, was essentially uh, a period of, uh, I think, uh, quiescence or before 63 about feminism, although there had been a lot of feminism before. Uh, but it was during the 60s that feminism, feminist theories uh, and methodologies began to develop. So that's what I want to talk about, to reflect upon uh, the context of 1963 and then move forward, or to do it from today, but to uh, look at what it was like in 63 and then move forward to today using a similar analysis to Carol in that respect. Uh, but I was an undergraduate, I became an undergraduate in 1963, which is why I feel uh, that uh, this is all the context about my life and other <coughs> women's students' life. Uh, and I've also been trying to uh, think about these kinds of issues, and I've just uh, sent my manuscript of a book called Feminism, Gender, and Universities, Politics, Passion, and Pedagogies to the publisher, finally. And it's about feminist academics, and I've got just over 100 feminist academics who I've talked to in it, looking back on their lives in higher education, some of whom, like me, were students around the time of the uh, Robbins report. And I do think that our generation could be seen somewhat as university pioneers, pioneers in terms of feminist uh, theories and feminist work. <coughs> and we are also, I think, very passionate pedagogues. But I'll come back to some of those issues. Uh, and I also. The term gender was not around in 1963, and the question of gender equality wasn't really around. So uh, to fast forward to today, and to think in particular about uh, Louise's work here, uh, the idea of uh, gender equality now is part of what Louise has argued is uh, part of the students, uh, the numbers game, and trying to change the rules of uh, the numbers game about gender equality, and I want to return to some of that. Uh, and also, uh, the example of things like she figures now, uh, a lovely name for looking at uh, gender in higher education amongst academics. So I want to bring together these kinds of ideas. And the question, as Louise has argued so strongly, about how we need to transform the rules of the game of higher education. And I also like, I haven't realized, Carol, uh, that uh, HE uh, was so strongly prefigured in the Robbins report. I know it was called the report on higher education, but the use of HE for it is the embodiment of the masculine identity. And the, so I, that, hence the title of my talk. Uh, and I finally want to raise some questions about what a fem feminist manifesto for university and for education more generally might look like. So, first of all, as I've said, uh, 
1963 was the year I went to university as an undergraduate. Um, feminism certainly wasn't on mine or others' radar then. So in this sense, some of this is a reconstruction of what times were like then, although I think what Carol's done is already do it for us, so I don't need to do nearly as much, thank you. Uh, but I was a, a witness as well as becoming a participant in it, and I think those two questions are quite important methodologically, and I'd quite like a discussion about it because I'm not quite sure what they are, what the differences are methodologically between being a witness and a participant here. Uh, it was a time of the development in the social sciences, and I went to university to study sociology. Uh, uh, but since then, there have been hugely changing discourses about equality and women and gender. As I, I say, gender was not a term used then. Uh, it was, uh, sex was still used, and you know, I'm going to refer in a moment to a table that David Willits has uh, had reconstructed for a pamphlet that he brought out last month. Uh, David Willits is our Minister for Universities and Science, and he brought out a pamphlet called Robins Revisited, Bigger and Better Higher Education. It's published by the Social Market Foundation. And he describes, he uses two terms, but he describes a changing gender balance of students, and of course he puts a very conservative gloss on it all, but he also, in his main table, he reconstructs the figures from uh, 1963 and 2000, and he calls it the relations between the sexes then, which I think probably draws on the table by coffee member in Robbins itself. Uh, so the time uh, <coughs> back uh, to uh, the 1960s, it was a, a conservative government in 1961 that appointed Lionel Robbins, uh, who I don't think he was Lord at the time. I think he might have been called Sir Lionel Robbins in 1961. He was an eminent economist and he was a professor at the LSE. So it's quite interesting about the, the Beaver and maybe Carol, you can go back and look at the Beaver again for what they said about the Robbins report. Uh, <laughs> Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Oh. Anyway, uh, he, um, he, it was, he was appointed to chair the committee. Uh, at the time, there was what uh, was called in the 70s, 60s and 70s at least, uh, a, a bipartisan political consensus about social democracy, about the importance of social welfare, the welfare state, the role of the family, and the role of women in the family. And there's an enormous amount of feminist work on all of that, so I won't uh, say too much about it. But the importance of uh, Robbins is that the, the committee was appointed to uh, ensure that higher education contributed to economic growth. And it was appointed to expand, as Carol's already said, the higher education system but it was part of expanding the British economy. And it was seen as important for social welfare, social growth. It wasn't uh, appointed, as we might say today, as David Willits argues in his pamphlet, that it has individual rates of return. They were see that higher education was seen to produce in all students what's, what was called then and what's been developed uh, by critique since then, the social rate of the return, that as a society, we will grow if we invest in higher education. So it wasn't for individuals, it was actually for society as a whole. Uh, so women's role in that uh, was only to play a small part, but nevertheless, it was an important part of the arguments about higher education contributing to social mobility and social uh, growth. Uh, although, of course, the, the question, as Carol's already said, uh, was it was very limited. And then only 25% of students, as Carol said, were female. Uh, Willits produces a number, 
which is, he says it was 68,000 out of 216,000. I can't get that to be 25%, but I don't know how we got the 25% figure. However, uh, maybe he's got better statisticians than I have to work out that. Uh, before uh, the Robins, and Carol's already said this, the uh, UGC had created new universities from 1961, which was part of that process of economic growth. Uh, but uh, the report was, uh, Robin's report was published in October 2013, and it was immediately ex accepted. And it was called the Robin's Principle for Economic Growth was university places should be available to all qualified by ability and attainment. And eligibility for ability rather, but the criterion for what we meant by qualified by ability was defined as two examination passes at GCE A levels. Uh, the other point about the report was that there was a commitment, and Robbins argued this, of public funds to develop and expand into a system. Before 1963, there was no system of higher education. There were, and um, again, Carol said uh, some of this, technical colleges, training colleges for teacher education, lots and lots of technical uh, colleges and colleges of advanced technology, which were for increasing skilled uh, manpower. And this was one of the arguments of that Robbins rejected in the Robbins report was about what was called manpower planning. And it was called manpower planning, so I, I think it's uh, interesting to uh, bring that in. And manpower planning focused in particular on technology. Uh, the key argument of Robbins then was to transfer uh, some of, uh, transform, sorry, some of the colleges of advanced technology, which at the time were called CATS, uh, in, uh, I never noticed that, uh, by the way, <laughs> into what was going to be called, uh, but they didn't ever use the term, they were going to be called sisters. Uh, but actually, they just became known as uh, universities. And the ones were places like Aston Bath and Strathclyde. Uh, so all the recommendations, as I've said, were accepted. Um, Cats were to become universities. In October 1963, I got up to, at the same time as the report came out, to Glasgow College of Advanced Technology to study the social sciences. I'd done very badly in my A-levels, and I'd been messing around as a, a whatever. And <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't get a place at the universities I'd applied to. So, and I went back to school, actually, to do, redo my A-levels. And then, uh, because of this push for, uh, in September 63, I went back to uh, school to, to the third year six to do my A-levels uh, again. And then uh, there was that, there were, as with the, what's called clearing now, there were the attempts to, uh, to encourage more students to university. And I got a place at, in Glasgow to do social sciences. Uh, by May of 1964, it had become Strathclyde University. Um, just by way of uh, a bit of gossip here, a fellow student of mine was uh, Sandy Macmillan. And he was a grandson of the man who, at the time I went to university, uh, was the Prime Minister, uh, Harold Macmillan. Harold Macmillan resigned in uh, October 1963 on the grounds of ill health from being Prime Minister. Uh, but Sandy was a student with me. And in the spring of uh, 1964, Quintin Hogg, uh, who was also Lord Hailsham, uh, and his granddaughter now is head of the Bank of England, uh, Sarah Hogg. Is that her name? Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, Quentin Hogg came to open the renamed university. And because Sandy was one of my friends, 
colleagues, we met him. And he, uh, and in fact, the social science students, interestingly, were those who uh, contributed to the celebrations for Strathclyde by becoming a new university. Interesting because social sciences weren't seen as very important at that time, and certainly not as part of the big Glasgow. Uh, so I was one of a very rare belief, breed because there were very few women students at the time. But I also got a means tested grant from uh, my LEA, which was the then West Riding of Yorkshire. Also doesn't exist anymore. Uh, <coughs> there have been so many changes over this last 50 years. But just to add to the point that Carol's made, many of my school friends didn't go to university, but did instead go on to what was called higher education and went to teacher training college. Uh, and uh, only one, uh, very few of us went to university and only one uh, went to Oxford. Uh, and as an aside, I think Carol also said this, uh, social work and nursing and paramedical professions were not part of university education at the time. Uh, and actually, neither was law, which is uh, something that most people uh, might find surprising today. Most people did not go to university if they were going to want to become solicitors or barristers uh, and, and did it uh, at college outside of the uh, university. So the numbers of un undergraduate students uh, the year before I went up were 216,000, so less than a quarter of a million, uh, which is uh, quite extraordinary transformation. And this is the table that I was referring to from uh, uh, the Willits reconstruction. It's, called, it's table 3.1 in his uh, booklet. And it's called full-time university students by sex, male versus female, and faculty or subjects. And he, he's had, obviously, I assume the department has reconstructed the tables for him. And they are very interesting, again, confirming what uh, Carol said. That uh, in all faculties, 75% uh, of students were male and 25% female. But in the humanities, which were a thir almost a third of all subjects, uh, the proportion was much lower. It was 58% to 42%. Uh, and in social studies, uh, much higher, 77% male and 23% female. And they were a much smaller proportion, as I've just said, of all uh, subjects, only 11%. By 2011 to 12, the transfer missions have been dramatic. Now we've got 46% male to 54% female. And in the humanities, that's an even uh, greater shift, 38% uh, uh, male to 62% female. And in social studies, 43 to 57%. Uh, but the other reversal is uh, the, the fact that hum, uh, humanities have gone down by two-thirds and social studies have gone up by two-thirds. Interesting reversal that we might uh, think about, but it's also both of those areas, and the reason I point it out, are mainly where feminist work has grown apace as well. Uh, now, uh, one of the other uh, issues that I just want briefly to comment on about Robbins before we move to uh, the present day, uh, Carol's talked about how women students were seen in the report. Uh, one of the things, uh, key things that the Robbins report talked about was how to finance this expansion of higher education and how the, uh, in particular, whether or not to do it through students and their parents or through the exchequer. And uh, the Robbins report considered using uh, student loans instead of the grant system which had been introduced by uh, the Anderson report in 1961. There have been uh, different 
forms of scholarship before 1961. Uh, but what the Robbins report said against student levels was, in particular, where women are concerned, the effect might well be either that British parents will be strengthened in their age-long disinclination to consider their daughters to be as deserving of higher education as their sons, or that the eligibility for marriage, to follow Carol's points, of the more educated will be diminished by the addition to their charms of what would it be, in effect, a negative dowry. Uh, I love that phrase. It's so old-fashioned, isn't it? It's as if you, it, it was... But this was how I was growing up, in a world in which uh, women were supposed to be supported by their uh, parents uh, until they got married, and then they were also supposed to support their uh, daughters on uh, uh, marriage by giving them a dowry. Unbelievable nowadays, I guess. <laughs> and so, uh, Robin said, on balance, we do not recommend immediate recourse to a system of financing students by loans. At a time when many parents are only just beginning to acquire the habit of contemplating higher education for such of their children, especially girls, as are capable of benefiting by it, we think it would probable that it would have undesirable disincentive effects. And then they went on, but if, as time goes on, the habit is more firmly established, the arguments of justice in distribution and of the advantage of increasing individual responsibility may come to weigh more heavily and lead to some experiment in this direction. So, as I've said, parents were expected to support their daughters on marriage and women were still expected to withdraw from the labour market on either marriage or motherhood. And Robbins argued against this as the impact it would have on their daughters. Uh, Willett's taking up this argument in his uh, concluding point of his pamphlet actually uh, says, and I, I'm not sure this is true of the whole Robbins report, but perhaps we can also have a discussion. He says, eventually, after over 40 years, we've ended up with a financing model very close to the one that Robbins really preferred. I wonder how he knows that Robbins really preferred <laughs> this, but loans repayable as a percentage of future earnings. Uh, and actually, that wasn't just the loan system that uh, Robbins considered. Never mind all of that. Willits is justifying the Robbins report as being very like what he wants today uh, by this sleight of hand. Uh, and I think that's interesting because that brings us uh, up to uh, the present. So, uh, the expansion, Carol's already talked about a lot of this, but here are some other uh, tables. We've had uh, an expansion over 50 years from a quarter of a million students to two million students in 2010 to 2011. Uh, but in all of that, the question of where women have gone in terms of their employment is also important and in terms of uh, not just becoming feminists but becoming academics. Uh, and of course that was, as Carol's already said, ignored in the Robbins report. Uh, but before we come back to academics, let's just look at some other figures. Uh, it, it's also the case that internationally now, uh, women are a ma majority of students. The she figures show uh, for the whole of the European Union that the proportion of female uh, students to um, male students is 55% and graduates is 59%. Uh, the, for the USA, the chronicle of higher education uh, also mentions this kind of figure, they say, uh, and this is a year ago now, that female undergraduates outnumber their male counterparts. Uh, and they go on and actually discuss it, uh, uh, I don't have time to do that now, that the undergraduate gender gap is especially striking amongst black students. And they also add that women are advancing in the professoriate as well, 
but one of their articles in this particular special issue is about Lady Academe, mm -hmm. uh, as if feminism hadn't taken place before. Anyway, uh, to move on the, the argument and return to this concept that we all now uh, take almost for granted, the idea of uh, gender equality. Uh, it seems to me, and I want to argue now, that the term as a concept has actually been taken over and incorporated into global and neoliberal uh, politics because it's actually firmly on the uh, international agenda. But the question is, is it there because of feminist or women's campaigning or is it part of a neoliberal takeover? So, for example, in March last year, UNESCO published, uh, and this was for the first time ever, the World Atlas of Gender Equality in Education. And that also showed this enormous pattern of increasing educational enrollments and huge amount of growth, not just in uh, education itself, uh, but in women's participation in education and higher education. So the growth globally has been uh, a five-fold increase in global higher education. So higher education now is absolutely a fundamental part of all economies and known largely as the knowledge economy. Uh, and in this, the, the Atlas uh, talks a lot about female enrollment at the tertiary level. And it talks about females being the principal beneficiaries of this growth. Although uh, they argue that the reason for female enrollment is not necessarily to do with uh, enhanced uh, opportunities, but international pressures. And al also they argue that even though women may have got more higher education, but access to higher education by women has not always translated into enhanced career opportunities, uh, and nor into the opportunity to use doctorates in their field of research. So even though there are more women students, more women graduates, they not, uh, ha do not have the same chances as many students. Returning to the UK then, uh, very quickly now, there has been, as I've already argued, a huge transformation in the language of feminism, gender equality in the law. But if we look at the uh, UK's Equality Challenge Unit, uh, which was set up uh, about eight years ago, nine years ago, uh, <coughs> its uh, mission statement on its website is that the ECU works to further and support equality and diversity for staff and students in higher education and seeks to ensure that staff and students are not unfairly excluded, marginalized or disadvantaged because of, and then they have a whole range of issues, age, disability, gender identity, marital or civil partnership status, pregnancy or maternity status, race, religion or belief, sex, sexual orientation, or through any combination of these characteristics or other unfair treatment. Okay, so from that they go to uh, looking at uh, presenting in their report for 2011 uh, an equality focused analysis of staff and students. And they look at the interplay of what they call multiple identities. And uh, they pr uh, the figures in their report will provide an evidence base on which to inform these objectives. They then present two separate reports. One is Equality in Higher Education, Part 1, about staff, and one is about students. And part 2 is about students, and this is year on year. Uh, the picture then for students is that gender now is a minor issue amongst these multiple identities. Uh, whereas uh, for staff, it's still an important issue. Uh, and they illustrate 
the rampant gender inequalities. The cover of the one for 2011 says there's a 16.3% median gender pay gap and a 20.3% mean gender pay gap, which, uh, given this equality focus, seems to me uh, huge. Uh, and this, 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 they say the statistic on the front cover shows the median and mean pay gaps between male and female staff working in higher or working in higher education across the UK. So it seems to me absolutely fascinating that two reports published the same day can be written and published together without any comment on the dissonance between the two in terms of gender equality or gender equity. Uh, so it's abundantly clear that despite all this huge increase in educational opportunities up to postgraduate research, where women have uh, attained as much, if not more than men, and of course Carol's right that women uh, historically were doing better than men in uh, access to education across the piece back in 1963. But they remain subordinate across all sectors of academic employment. And this is not really discussed as a particular issue. So it, these are just uh, more headlines from uh, the report. That again, 53.8% of all staff were women, mirroring uh, the undergraduate and graduate levels, but uh, the differences in where they get to within uh, staffing in higher education are dramatic. And the final figure that they show is that 76.1% of UK national staff in professorial roles and 67.4% of non-UK national staff in professorial roles were white males. This is their figure. Uh, so I'm trying to argue, I think, that gender equality has gone somewhere other than radical uh, transformations. Um, uh, it's really now part of the neoliberal project. Because uh, if we look to Europe as well, you can see that European policies are arguably strongly in favour of gender equality for economic competition and business innovation, not for social reasons anymore. Uh, and for example, uh, Robert Jan Schmitz, who was the EC Director General for Research and Innovation in Europe, said, the promotion of gender equality is part of the European Commission's strategic approach in the field of research and innovation. It contributes to the enhancement of European competitiveness and the full realisation of European innovation potential. Uh, and she figures similarly <coughs> make similar kinds of comments. So they say, while there are equivalent numbers of women and men working in the field of humanities, only 27% of researchers in engineering and technology are female. And what about researchers' career for progression? And then uh, the uh, EC commissioner who chaired the publication of these figures in 2009 said, women account for 59% of graduates, whereas men account for 82% of all professions. Do you find that hard to believe? Check out chapter three. That's his comment, <laughs> which proves it. it's the case that the white men still are dominating the professor. So, in conclusion then, I think the prospects for gender equity or equality in education or academia are uncertain. And the term itself uh, seems to me to have lost all its radical potential and meaning. And, uh, however, I do think what's interesting, as Carol's already argued, that uh, feminist discourse and analysis are coming back very much onto the agenda in times of austerity. Uh, but whatever you uh, want to argue, I think we need to, as uh, Louise 
has said, and I'm sure he's going to argue later, we do need to break out of this vicious cycle of male domination in politics and leadership of uh, academes. Uh, and we need to think more about feminist networking and forms uh, of resistance and uh, being resilient to these issues uh, as a way of um, reducing this encroachment of what's also been called academic capitalism and market forces. And we need to think about how to create a fairer education for all boys and girls to deal with misogyny, which also wasn't a term on the agenda back in 1963, by the way. I think one could never have named it as misogyny back then. Uh, but it is now a form of everyday sexism as well as uh, misogyny. And we also have, at least I think this is one of the positive changes, uh, we are able to name things as sexual abuse and harassment and misogyny in ways in which we couldn't 50 years ago. Thank you.